There's magic in a river. There's a strange hypnotic force in waters moving relentlessly toward the sea. Chattering merrily through the shoals, twisting, turning, bubbling, rolling. Suddenly gathering its forces to thunder mightily over a cliff. Then its fury spent to meander solemnly, quietly through the deep pools. A river, a place of mystery and surprise. Who knows what the next bend will reveal? Who knows what lurks in that deep hole near the bank? Rivers, special places to those who know and love the wild country. Arteries of life that flow through our forests, our bogs, and our barrens and sometimes through our cities. Rennies, they call this river. It winds through the heart of old St. John's, from Long Pond to Kittavitty, twisting its way around commercial buildings, institutions, schools, playgrounds, homes. Thousands of people live on or near its banks, the city has sprawled around Rennie's, embracing it, threatening it. It wasn't always this way. For centuries, life in salty old St. John's revolved around the harbor. The houses, the businesses huddled together as close as they could get to the ships and the sea. Rennie's was back somewhere over the hill, a wilderness stream. Gradually, St. John's began to change and grow. And the land that was raw wilderness was conquered, first by the plow. Farms grew up along the banks of Rennie's River and a flour mill. In fact, that's where the river got its name, for the mill was owned by Mr. Rennie. In time, the mill and the farms were gobbled up. The new St. John's was advancing northward and westward, engulfing the river. Till eventually, even Long Pond, the source of Rennie's River, became a part of the city. Rennie's River and its headwaters had been captured, conquered, tamed. By rights, you know, Rennie's should be an open sewer today. Yet look, as beautiful a river as you'll find anywhere a ribbon oasis in the heart of old St. John's. People are drawn to Rennie's River. People of all ages and interests. They come to photograph, to play, to walk, to relax. And to think back, perhaps, to the carefree days of childhood. Rennie's is a special place to those who've grown up in this part of St. John's. It's a place of dreams and memories, of catching trout and sailing boats, of swimming in Silver Pool or Rennie's Pool or Sliding Rock, of the days when this was the Amazon, the Mississippi, and the Mackenzie all rolled into one. Steve Herder, publisher of the Evening Telegram, was born and raised near Rennie's River and still lives on its banks. A staunch conservationist and member of Rennie's River Committee, you can often catch him strolling near the river, watching the trout leap the falls, and thinking back to his childhood days on Rennie's. What are your first memories of Rennie's River? Well, I'm catching pricklies. Like they were an inch and a half long, we caught them in our hands and uh, took them home, put them in a bucket where they died, of course. <laughs> Did you ever bother to catch bigger trout? Uh, we caught one that's, no. Well, the years make memory sweeter. I think now that it was about seven pounds, but uh, what it really was, I don't know. We caught that in our hands. 
up in uh, Kelly's Brook, which is now a culvert, and I would say we got it roughly, my brother got it actually, uh, roughly where left field of the ballpark is uh, today. We call that the back bog in those days. I've seen trout here that would go easily seven pounds jumping at the falls. They, they had to be seven pounds. I mean, they're 26, 28 inches long. It must be quite a sight when, when the main run is up. Oh, goodness gracious, yes. Uh, you, can't, you can't count, but it's so spectacular in middle tiny river, and you can see a 30-foot wide river where the trout are spawning, and they're literally from bank to bank. And uh, you can see the males fighting, and you can see the females digging the reds, and oh, it's, it's uh, just spectacular. It's a real natural history showcase right in the middle of St. John's. Yes, uh, it is, and, and other rivers as well, too. And all this river from uh, right up to Long Pond, and then, uh, and then beyond uh, it, Leary's Brook, and, and other places like, uh, like that. That's, that's marvelous, right in the middle of the city. Where else could you do that? So as a St. Johnsman, you're pretty proud of this river. Oh, heavens, yes. Uh, as I say, it's, uh, for me, it's just full of boyhood memories, and uh, now I'm just enjoying it in a, in, a, in a different way. River watching, looking for the lightning flash of a trout hurtling the falls, on its way to the spawning ground somewhere upstream. It's not a bad way to pass an hour or so on a sunny day in October. But if you know where to go, if you seek out the special places in Rennie's River and the other streams nearby, and if you're quiet and move slowly, you may see for yourself a real spectacle of nature. For some time in November, when the water temperature is just right, the trout begin to gather together to lay and to fertilize their eggs. You will see the fins knifing through the top of the water as the fish jockey for position looking for that special place in the gravel where they'll dig their nests. The brown trout, a beautiful fish, first introduced to Newfoundland at the headwaters of Rennie's River about 80 years ago. A tougher, more resilient trout than the speckled, they've survived and prospered and spread throughout many waterways in eastern Newfoundland. German brown, we call them here in Newfoundland for some strange reason. Some of these sea-run brown trout are quite large. Like the salmon, they grow quickly in the ocean and always return to the river to spawn. Rennie's River and the other rivers of St. John's hold incredible numbers of brown trout. Biologists from the university and the fisheries department who've been studying our streams for several years have come up with some remarkable figures. They say it's the most productive waterway for brown trout in the world. No other river comes even close. Up until our waters were studied, the top stream was one in New Zealand with 28 grams of trout per square meter. Here in St. John's, it's twice that figure. Scientists were and still are astounded. They keep coming back to check and to double check. Each summer, they're out with their students, sampling the fish in stretches of the river, using a strange method of fishing called electroshocking. A pulsating direct current is sent into the water. For some reason, the fish are attracted to the positive pole and are momentarily stunned. They float to the surface where they're caught and then placed in a mild anesthetic. Now, uh, they're easier to, uh, this makes them easier to handle, to measure, to measure, to weigh, size. and to get scale samples. 12.9. You'd like the picture of this big guy, right? This is, uh, it's quite harmless to the trout. They're released moments later and with a flick of the tail are back to normal again. Wondering, I suppose, about the trials and tribulations of modern life in Rennie's River. On some parts of the rivers of St. John's, the trout are quite small, but there are places where you'll find the real whoppers.
John Gibson, the man doing the electrofishing, is a fisheries scientist who studied brown trout in different parts of the world. But he's also an avid angler, a man who spends a lot of time on Rennie's River, walking, fishing, enjoying the scenery. To him, it's a very special place. Well, John, it's quite a river system, isn't it? It really is. It's very beautiful and very productive and, you know, provides a lot of fun for everybody, for uh, anglers and the naturalist who likes to walk along and see the birds and so on, and, and for the scientist too, who's got all aspects. And uh, rivers being a living system, besides supporting the fish, there's mink and otter here. And, uh, and of course, things like kingfishers and herons, even ospreys and long pond. And, uh, and very nice aesthetic, aesthetically, people like walking along, just everyone likes to look at running water and it's fun to see the fish leaping and this sort of thing. So it's really, it's really an absolute gem, you know, it really, really is a beautiful thing. I've seen a lot of rivers and fished a lot of rivers that are uh, not nearly as comparable to this. And uh, in fact, this summer I was over uh, uh, on holiday in England. My brother is a keen fisherman and he's a member of a fishing club there uh, near England. It's a trout stream similar to this and it costs him 800 pounds a year. And we fish and I caught two fish. It's a lot of fun, but uh, uh, not nearly as good as this, this river here. <laughs> How many could you expect to catch here then? Well, uh, the last day of the season last year, I think I got 17 in two hours. And, uh, you know, that's, that's probably not exceptional for anyone who can wheel the fly. Well, now, most Newfoundlanders, and I've grown up near this river, uh, wouldn't bother with these brown I know, trout. I know, it's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it has always amazed me that you can uh, fish this at any time, and uh, it's surprising if you see someone else here. And uh, it's, all, it's all a matter of, uh, you know, what, what you're used to. And I spent a lot of my life fishing for brown trout, so I think very, very valuable fish. Yeah, it, it really, really is an absolute gold mine. And, uh, and I think if it got around uh, how valuable it is, uh, we'd probably have a lot of people coming to fish it. And uh, it's just, just a very nice thing to have right in the city. That's, I think that's the most incredible part about it. The trout are thrown back. They'll be back to fight another day. Perhaps that's the way it should be here in this crowded city. Not everyone loves Rennie's for its trout fishing. For some, it's a place to enjoy other forms of nature. And it is a rich and beautiful enclave in the center of town. An abundance of wild and cultivated plants crowd its banks. Tall trees tower out of the sheltered valley, and birds of all sorts make their homes here. It's a good place for a naturalist such as Charlie Horwood, who's known Rennie's River all his life. I would say this is one of the most beautiful parts of the river. Just up here we see the, the water over stone. There's something about that that touches the heart, you know. Uh, the strata is all turned up on end here. And uh, the water flowing over the strata makes it very beautiful. What about the vegetation here now? That's kind of interesting well, too, isn't perhaps it? Perhaps this thing wouldn't appeal to everybody, but uh, there was a lot of this, so a great deal of this meadow sweet grew along the river where I grew up, about a mile and a half upstream from here. And whenever I see Meadow Sweet, I always think of the places where we swam in O'Leary's Brook 50 years ago. Which is gone now, of course. Oh yes, it's destroyed, destroyed by the, uh, the Prince Philip Drive. You know? is, that what, is that what makes this stretch of river especially important to you now? Well, that's one thing. Wherever there's Meadow Sweet, I feel like I'm, I'm back again at O'Leary's River. You know? yeah. You carry the binoculars with you, you watch for birds too, I suppose. Oh, there's usually something interesting to see. You may walk for half an hour before you see something, but you're almost sure to see something. Any day in summer when you go up this little path, in summer you're bound to see 
cedar wax wings, which are probably the most elegant of our native birds. Mockingbirds have been seen near this river, Charlie told me, and it's a real rendezvous for the blue jays who planted these oak trees. First, I thought Charlie was pulling my leg, but no, he assured me blue jays were seen flying here with acorns taken from neighboring gardens. They dropped or buried them in the grass some years ago. And now the oak trees are springing up everywhere along this stretch of river. It's a little enclave of nature right in the middle of the town. Charlie, as we speak now, there's construction going on behind us and it's very obvious we're right in the center of a town. Does that worry you at all? It does somewhat, yes. But I am happy that uh, the river itself is being preserved and a lot of people are conscious of the value of the river, the value of the little strip of green around the river. Rennie's flows from Long Pond, a sizable body of water on the edge of the campus of Memorial University. The students come here a lot to learn how to paddle a canoe and handle a sail. Some like to paddle up a brook that flows into Long Pond. Here in this marshy flat near Kelly's farm, it's still possible to flush wild ducks or to surprise an otter. The paddles drown out the distant sounds of traffic. A touch of wilderness, a gunshot on the busiest road in town. Marsh, forest, wild country, clear, cold waters. Here on our doorstep, how is this possible? Cities and people pollute. Why hasn't it happened here? Well, the sad truth is it has happened here many, many times. Upstream from here, Leary's is now a ditch. Silt, pollutants, industrial waste, sewage, garbage. It's all happened before, and it's still a constant threat. Fish have been suffocated, killed, their spawning beds choked, ruined. Downstream, where Kelly's Brook, the tributary that was turned into a sewer, discharges its contents, the results are there for all to see and smell. Larry Felt told me about it. At one time, there used to be, where that culvert uh, hole was, that water coming out, there used to be a small tributary of Rennies River that ran along Empire Avenue over to the, what is now the new taxation center. It used to be a major spawning tributary, too. Uh, over the years, uh, it had been filled in in bits and pieces, and finally, in 1977, uh, the city decided to fill all of it in. So what we have now is just a, a, a foul-smelling pipe that dumps a lot of water in. It's the major pollution problem, really, on the entire Rennies River now. Yet you can smell it now, can't you? Oh, yes, and depending upon the time of, of day, uh, I've seen everything from tar and oil to, uh, you know, human excrement just, just coming right out of it. Wow. So this is the main problem right now? Well, in terms of, in terms of pollution, yes. If we, could, if we could settle this problem here, then uh, I, I think that, you know, we, in terms of the pollution problems on the system, they'd be, they'd be pretty much taken care of. And then we'd have to deal with silt and channel, you know, and stream habitat destruction. But pollution, yes. Downstream, pollution has been the problem. Far upstream, at the headwaters, where the city is still expanding, it's another kind of problem. Larry took me to Juniper Brook, near Leary's Industrial Park. Well, Dave, this is a, a stretch of the river that was uh, channelized or ditched to, uh, ostensibly to prevent flooding, oh, 10 or 12 years ago. And as you can see, as you, you look up and down it, uh, what they did, they had a, uh, a problem of a little bit of flooding in some of the meadowland here that they wanted to build on. So what they did is they simply took a stream that used to wander back and forth and turned it into a, a little shallow ditch. It's destroyed the ability of this section of, of the river 
to produce any kind of insect life. Uh, and in doing that, of course, there's the fish have had to move out. They've also done things, uh, they've cleared the sides of the river, so they've uh, taken away any kind of cover that would provide protection for animals and fish, and also uh, cover would help to keep the, the water temperature down. As you can see, we're, we're completely in the open here, and this means that this stream is exposed on a sunny day to continuous sun that warms the water and makes the water that much warmer downstream so that, once again, things like mud trout uh, have a very difficult time surviving. And so a stretch of river dies, and during a rainfall, the water funnels down to fan out and flood elsewhere. The flooding problem has not been eased. It's just been transferred downstream. Larry took me to another place nearby, a tributary of Leary's Brook, another painful example of what not to do. Well, Dave, what happens here is that the river disappears, that uh, the river comes down through those woods here, and from this point until down and back of us, until it empties into uh, Leary's Brook, go uh, several hundred yards from here, it's entirely underground. But uh, as you can see, uh, we have no river from this point down, and from here upstream, all we have is, a, is an empty ditch. Off we went to see yet another example, a happier one, thank heavens. This stream, loaded with fine trout, is on the edge of a construction site and will be protected by a dike. It's too close to the stream for Larry's liking, but it is an encouraging sign. This at least is better than some of the past efforts. At least there's a, some sign of an awareness, you know, that you simply can't go in and, and ditch the middle of the river to, to solve your flooding problems. So at least it's got a chance for that dike. It's got a chance. A new awareness that we can blend industrial development with natural surroundings is gradually taking hold in the city. Citizens, government, and industry seem to show a new concern not to repeat the mistakes of the past. A 60-foot buffer zone has been established along our rivers. The newly formed St. John's Waterways Committee is touted as a model for all of Canada. Concerned groups are making their voices heard. And so Rennie's continues to live. The river that refused to die is still with us. Battered and bruised at times, but still on bow. A place of beauty and a legacy for generations to come. How many generations, I wonder, have thrilled to the sight of the big fish jumping the falls? They still do. Rennie's River, a thousand thoughts, a thousand memories, a place of quiet, simple beauty. A stream flowing forever through the heart of our city and through the heart of its people. A river that refused to die. Well, I think it's an enormous attraction to have what is now a clean stream right in the, we're half a mile away, I think, from, from downtown and uh, it's right in the middle of our city. It's, it's beautiful to look at. It's a gorgeous place to, uh, to walk. And I would think that it would be a fall attraction for, uh, for tourists. The weather is beautiful. Uh, to be able to walk a river right in the middle of the city or some of the smaller streams and around the ponds that are in the uh, city and see trout in their natural state, I think it would be quite an attraction. We don't realize what a, what a gold mine we have here. And uh, it's going to become more valuable. As St. John's grows, uh, we're going to need more areas like this. And to have it in the city is really unique. And it's not difficult to keep intact. And this is a point we must get over. It's just because it's in the city doesn't mean we can't live with it. And uh, it's quite possible to look after it. If we treat it properly, don't abuse it, and, uh, and, uh, and realize the value of it.